This is a session from our archives, the December 17th, 2020 discussion about how artificial intelligence and AI and security are interplaying and what we're going to have to do to make things work together. As always, Club 23 discussions cover a lot of ground and I think you will enjoy this one. Thanks. Mark, um, I don't think your law is, um, I want to disprove your deals law. Disprove it? Uh, basically, the main things I, I put aside because I didn't want to start typing too much, but basically, <laughs> uh, basically, it. what about all the services? And basically, I think you actually agree with me. What about all the services that are created that no one ever actually uses? Basically, the, the issue is, and I think you, this is where I think you were getting at, is that if you create it, People start assuming that you have to start um, supporting it. Right. And that's right. not the case. You basically should wait before you support things, even though it's people start rushing towards it. Oh. Um, and I started trying to come up with all the examples that people where people tried to where the services came and then they and they be you no, know, it's just stopped. So basically, you don't want just because AWS comes up with a new type of service doesn't mean everyone else to start thinking about how they're going to want to support that type of service also. Right, right. No, I mean, it's a good point. And certainly it's not a, um, a meant to be much more than a, um, a joke of a law. But, you know, for the most part, <laughs> for the most part, my, my own history is has been that, um, uh, you know, I learned the hard way, frankly, I try to do somebody a favor, mm -hmm. um, create some sort of access or um, give them a new tool. And before you know it, the whole department is depending, demanding the same access or mm -hmm. every person that does that job through the entire division uh, of the company wants to be able to do that same mm -hmm. thing. And it was never anything that was any more than a favor to begin with. Now I've got to either figure out how to justify shutting it off or figure out how to justify supporting it um, in real terms. And when you think about or at, or when I was there. thinking about, I was thinking about edge specifically, and a lot of the companies that I'm talking to that are enabling things inside stores, as an example, are enabling some minor features that individually don't seem to be mm -hmm. a big deal at the store. And if any one of them were off, um, who would complain or why would they think, think it a big deal? But the combination of those services um, are almost the web that holds the store together now. Uh, relative to modern technology. And when the the group of those services go away, it's almost as if you've taken away the point of sale tool and people all of a sudden have to figure out how to um, do math in their head and record sales on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, I was just thinking about it from my own personal experience and and from that angle that you do, generally speaking, have to have a plan for uh, uh, rolling out any new service, because if you don't, um, and you think you're just doing it because, well, I've got extra cycles or I've got extra CPUs or I've got extra mm -hmm. bandwidth before you know it, um, somebody's going to be requiring that, that, that favor you turned on become a, a justified approved and supported service. Well, isn't that why people use terms like beta or what's what, what you call it before beta, right? Well, um, that's that's the thing, Larry. I mean, when you're talking about something that goes through, when you're talking about something that goes through major uh, project approval, you get all those kinds of things, right? You have teams that do beta and, and user acceptance testing and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times there are services that can be turned on, especially from a pure infrastructure standpoint, that don't require a whole lot of, um, uh, you know, team investigation and user acceptance approval. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, when you turn on something as a favor for someone, uh, the only approval is the person that asked for the favor. And if they start using it and then other people decide they want to use it, well, it's at that point, your ability to roll it out in a traditional production model, release to production model goes down the tubes. And if you're a service provider, you get really bogged down, just like with a lot of other, I don't know if we've talked to you like in terms of having uh, the, what's the model clients where you want to have the the early clients that you 
get bogged down with because you just want to spend extra time with them. Well, there, there is, there is, I think there's a linkage there, Larry. I mean, I wasn't thinking that way, but I do think that there's a linkage there. I mean, and I've, I, it's funny, I was just advising um, a, a startup, uh, one of the advice, uh, startups that I advise, I was just advising them the other day. And I was talking about to them about the risk of getting too embedded in an early, but very large customer. Mm -hmm. and focusing on delivering exactly what that customer wants, mm -hmm. whether or not it's what um, the product should have, um, uh, you know, for every other customer. And uh, they have to recognize two things. One is that they may be creating cycles that are used only by one customer, while two, they're, they're effectively pulling money out of their 401k account as far as their um, schedule for their product or their service um, and their available hours of time because they never recover that. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a snowball effect, unfortunately. Uh, Rob, did you want to take a lead? I took your conversation away from you. No, no, no. This is, I, I, I'm fascinated by this conversation and you're, you're poking me in all the, in, in places that make me want to shout. So it's, it's an, it makes it that which qualifies as excellent. Uh, to oh, me. and by the way, Ed, I I poked Paul on Twitter a lot this week with his yeah. new boss, based off our conversation from last week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he started working with Equinix, and basically the the head of Equinix, I asked him a question, and he mentioned something about open that that was open hardware. I'm like, oh, and then I'm like, asked his head something, then said. And I've been talking about this, CC Paul. And then Paul went on a seven point uh, rant. I hope he doesn't <laughs> stop mad at me. <laughs> the, um, you know, I, I actually am sure he will appreciate one, the elevation of it and two, the discussion because Paul's a, I love discussion type of person. Um, I, you know, I'm, I, so. I just wanted ahead, to Mark, mention something along what Mark had said, uh, Ink to Me had a separate release, well, had a separate test path for AOL for their network caching product because AOL was their big customer mm -hmm. and uh, saw the same thing with cloud.com where every release was driven by certain multiple customers who said, if we only had and uh, mm. yep. it was it was just a, a treadmill rat race kind of thing. Yep, we ran into the same things at DocuSign. If we tried to get too down the rabbit hole of what a large customer might, might want, it would distract from what we were trying to do for the larger community. Exactly, exactly the point. Yeah, um, we. I mean, the, the specific example, first example where I was in a position enough to to recognize the problem and. Um, be partially responsible for trying to fix it was I was with service mesh and we were working with the bank of America and mm -hmm. bank of America, you know, they spent $6 billion on it. Uh, and they were doing a proof of concept with us that was going to last a year. And, uh, eventually, and, um, they were asking for all kinds of things that were not ever on our original roadmap, but it's really hard to say no to somebody that who might end up spending, you know, millions with you. Um, if they get it right, but it, it's, it's a dangerous path. It's like, it's like, it's the same path or the same, same sort of risk that you have when you're talking about, um, uh, doing too much, um, or when you end up doing too much professional services as part of a software release and being dependent on those dollars, um, that, that sets, uh, um, a bad precedent for focus in the company and, um, <laughs> But, but this thing is, is product design, right? Yeah. So what you're what you're talking about, Excel, right? You know, has a whole bunch of built-in functions, but it's fundamentally fungible. Is what makes it so adaptable? If you've identified where you can do customization, I think it's a reasonable thing. Like, I mean, because we're we're doing exactly what you're describing, although literally we do almost no custom. You know, there's very little customization. Things that that are our customers ask us to do become productized after three iterations or sooner, so, depending yeah. on what they do. But it's, it's so Rob, design. I mean, that's the design is fungible stuff, right? We extend the product using a plugin system. So the API changes don't become permanent until there's grounds for it. Um, 
that's because but... you figured out how to do it without getting trapped down the rabbit hole. You've got the abstraction layer in there. Whereas with a lot of these start, when you're in a startup, it's just, we need this. And it it's how spaghetti code happens and how all the other issues happen. It's okay. The customer just needs this one thing and they'll buy more product. And even if they buy more product, you're locking into a single provider uh, if you haven't architected it such that it's expandable to different applications. You're, you're, you're making me smile because I'm thinking about the my infrastructure as code. I, I did a five minute infrastructure as code summary for a local group. Um, and one of the things about this was if you're just duct taping things together, you're not really doing infrastructure as code. But we see, I mean, this isn't just a product problem. It's an internal company problem. I was talking to yes. a company yesterday. They have two different products that we would replace and extend. And so they're like, yeah, we want one thing that's standard. But at the same time, it's so meshed to Mark's original point, right? It's so, it's so meshed in their organization that pulling it out is is going to be it's very hard to shut down services once you have well, it, it gets to what you'd said before where you get the the scope sprawl where these applications end up getting spidered into an enterprise in all these unclear and indeterminate ways so you end up with dependencies that you don't necessarily foresee when you go to move these sorts of things out we we see that a lot in the data center space over here at equinix yeah one of the one of the only good things about having a Bank of America as a customer, no, as AT and T as a customer with um, Ink to Me was their network was so freaking messed up that we had to have special. We sent a team of of test engineers out to to their site to work on their network and develop test suites that could find the problems with their proxies. And the only good thing about that was that we now had a solution for other companies who had just as messed up networks. So it be, happened to be a general application, but it was in search of satisfying a single customer and a lot of resources. Yeah. Yeah. That's dangerous. I mean, and, and, you know, it's going to be different for every situation, right? I mean, it's, um, it's, de it depends on how your code is designed. It depends on, um, on how the team that's involved in the, uh, in the proof of concept is, um, is dependent or not dependent on, um, helping you build the rest of your code. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of things in there that determine the value, but it, it, it points, I think, to, you know, to, to Larry's part of the question, my part of the question, and, and Rob's point, I think it, it points to the fact that you just can't go into building something for people without a plan for how to get out of it. Um, and whether getting out of it is a positive thing or getting out of it is considered a negative thing, it's, it's all a factor of um, how, did you, how did you plan to, to get this rolled out in the first place, whose hours were involved, and once you've done with it, who's going to support it? And when you're doing it, have you made a decision that's viable uh, and justifiable against effort that could have been put against something that the business could have perceived as more valuable, right? So the, the bottom line is I didn't, when I was doing people favor as an infrastructure weenie at HP in the 90s, um, before I started learning my lesson, I wasn't going to my CIO or my head of infrastructure and saying, could I be spending my time more successfully on something else? I was making a customer happy and I thought that was a good enough reason to do something, right? And that's just a very simple example, but um, uh, it's, 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 it's as, you know, no, no different from how a government agency might put in a road and then next year ask you for money to pay for it in taxes for, um, for support and upkeep of the road. No, that should have been part of the plan. You don't build the road unless you've got a period of money to support the road after it's gone into place. Otherwise, the road was never justified in the first place. And, and 
our projects are, are, are not dissimilar, regardless of whether we sell them to a customer or are running them ourselves inside our business. That was, that was reminds me of the need for a go back plan. You know, what is, right. what is your plan to go back to the starting line if you encounter a, a hard stop situation? When I was deploying IP phone systems and contact centers, I used to have to build those all the time because if something went sideways, I had to get back to where we started before business opened. Yep. Well, and this is the value of abstraction layers from that, that mm -hmm. perspective and, and not consuming things as, as directly. Although it's, you know, um, in, my, in the chat, I was ranting on Terraform which, you know, brilliant strategy for becoming an essential product without any permission or controls in, in place at all. Um, they, you know, they're still at zero dot, they're now at one four, and they introduced significant breaking changes between um, 12, you know, 12, 12, 13, and 14 have, um, you know, a degree of breaking changes with their, their whole architecture. Um, and, but there, you know, it's like, well, it's not released software yet. You know, four years, what, six years old now, and it's not released. So I, I, that there, there's elements here where it's sort of unexcusable. And then we all jump on the bandwagon because it's, be, you know, to Mark's point, it's become an essential service. Um, my favorite, I, I'm going to tell a story, but then I, I do want to pivot this to inflection points because this is, I think, our last real meeting until we meet for the, uh, four hour summit. Oh no. Wow. We'll, we'll probably do some unofficial planning meetings, um, between or a little holiday spirit. Um, the, you know, the, the very famously Microsoft re-implemented APIs when they came out, I think with windows 95, they re-implemented bugs that were in the previous versions of Windows because those bugs had become embedded in the software, in their software ecosystem. And so they literally, when, when they, it took them years to get this right, but they had to test every single game, every, like they went to their ecosystem and tested and tested and tested, and they would re-implement API defects that people had been using as workarounds because if they didn't fix them, the games that they had already been sold would fail. And for them to keep market, they had to re-implement those things. Today's market, though, we don't we we're very much burn the bridges. Um, this is what drives me nuts. We had this conversation in one of the the Amazon recaps that I was in, where it's like, yeah, Amazon's like, yeah, we're changing the service around. You know, you have you know six months to get off of it, or, or CentOS. Oops, <laughs> hey, sorry, you can't depend on CentOS for production anymore. Thank you very much. Um, We've we've gotten to a point where we're we're expecting people to build systems in IT that um, try to break Mark's law, and Edge is definitely not going to be like that. You put a device in the field, it's in the field. Yeah, yeah. There's there's no going back. I mean, from a security risk standpoint, from a data collection and value of data standpoint, to um, uh, somebody is. I mean, it. Somebody takes some small feature that you've implemented for something else and turned it into a safety feature that becomes now fundamental to operation of a heavy piece of equipment or robotics or traffic planning or something. And uh, a year later, when it fails and a car crashes, somebody's going to come and say, what the fuck? Why wasn't this working? Why wasn't it protected? Why wasn't it being updated? Why weren't the security patches applied? And you're like, uh, I only applied that to collect weather information for a day and left it there. <laughs> Yeah, or it was a hack because I was waiting for a patch to come out, but it got rolled out, and then somebody right. put something on top of it. Yeah. Right. Do you do you think that the supply chain hack with SolarWinds is going to? Um, my dog's excited about SolarWinds. Um, I shouldn't have named him SolarWinds. That was a huge mistake. <laughs> um, Mine's What's Up Gold, so don't feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> The, <laughs> the, um, but that, you know, the supply chain aspect of what we're talking about, it's, it's, you know, one, you got to be able to update quickly, but two, um, you know, rolling out those updates could potentially then compromise your whole system. It, it seems like an impossible bind. It, it really does. And, and I don't, I don't mean to, you know, jump in in front of everyone else, but the, when I heard about the solar winds hack, um, it actually made me um, 
uh, uh, reminded me of supply chain hacks that our own NSA was doing uh, with disk drives out of Taiwan, mm. uh, uh, updating uh, firmware to allow for uh, remote hacking um, before they ever arrived on people's desks and even un unboxing and reboxing to look identical to the original box. Um, and so, you know, it's not as if um, uh, Russia or China or whoever it is did this uh, is the first to do it, but certainly they did it really, really well. I, I am frankly terrified uh, and I'm glad I don't run a, a large infrastructure organization anymore um, because I'm terrified of, of the, not only the precedent that this sets, but the onus that it will put on large organizations from a security standpoint. We imagine, I mean, you work for Equinix, right? Um, and and the, the onus that many of your buyers, certainly many of the buyers of companies that I've worked with in the past, on the security and operational perfection that you will provide them as your customer, imagine having to do that for every vendor that supports the delivery of your service. Yep, it's it's horrifying. The, the scale and breadth of what this represents is, is really the most terrifying element of it because it's the first one we've uncovered. I, I think we'd be delusional to think it's the only one out there. Yeah, I would agree. Do you guys, were you, when you read about how the hack happened and that it was sitting in the code for six months and all that stuff, did you, were you surprised? Like, did this surprise you how, how it happened or the, how they inserted it in and all that stuff? Andrea, I mean, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a, historically, I'm a little bit of a spy junkie, although I don't do that much reading in that area anymore because I, unfortunately, I've given up my fun time reading and I tend to do it more for work these days and for the last couple of years. Um, uh, uh, plus my social justice side of me has taken over and it's like I feel like I'm, I'm ruining society if I'm reading a Tom Clancy novel instead of reading The Color of Law or something like that. But um, all that being equal... You know, the history around, um, about, around spycraft, especially from um, Russia and uh, China as two perfect examples, are that they will build systems that they don't expect rewards from for anywhere from 18 months to 18 years. So it doesn't surprise me a bit when you see the target delivery audience for solar winds that I would have, I would have put something in, you know, in with a project planner who didn't even plan to put the code into the product for another three years. I would have been all over that if I was a Russian spy because the opportunity was so large, right? Um, so it it really doesn't surprise me what what um, what. Uh, actually, I don't know that it, it surprises me that we didn't do a better job at. Um, at uh, you know, validating back doors and stuff like that. I mean, when you consider the complexity of these products, knowing all that before you implement uh, just seems like too much to ask. But uh, you know, as we started talking about, it, it seems like maybe somehow that's going to be the criteria going forward. When it gets back to a problem that's existed since well, software was developed, right? Security has always been a third or fourth thought in yep. in product development. And that history is being exploited, you know, by by the attackers because they've been paying attention to what what screen doors were left unlocked, yep. you know, and, and, and what, be, what windows yeah. didn't have any glass put on. Will yeah. this be the inflection point that changes that, like, or are you surprised that the inflection ha hasn't well, somebody, already happened? Yeah, somebody I'm surprised it hasn't happened already. Earlier. And we didn't we didn't really answer it. Somebody, I don't know if that was Rob or Larry. Somebody asked that question earlier whether whether this would. Um, finally change how people prioritized um, security. I think, uh, I think the, the, from my perspective, the simple perspective is that we have to be careful of um, getting into a position where we get ever, ever better at chasing the symptoms of a hack. And we need to get better at finding ways of, of keeping um, the hack from having any value and, I, and that may sound counterintuitive, but the the tools that um, uh, uh, we're building these days, um, some for good purpose and some for nefarious reasons, maybe AI tools or machine learning tools, um, there to me, there really is no reason why over time we can't just assume that 
um, our networks will be hacked and that AI will be um, uh, managing uh, anomalies on that network. And, Unless it's uh, been hacked too. <laughs> what's that? Unless well, it's been hacked too. That's well, always a possibility. Unless it's the Especially AI that does training. the hacking. Right. Well, AI- but wait, would, would solar winds have been caught then? Because the system sat for six months, right? Yeah, Without. no, they would have been. They would have well, been caught like, because it. I mean, in real terms, from from a, when you think about the potential power of an AI solution, in real terms, the fact that packets were leaving encrypted, hidden as something else, that would have been exactly what you would have uh, asked AI to be looking for. AI would have been smart enough to realize was not normal traffic, and they would have flagged it. I would think. I but haven't read this. Yeah. Is anyone to blame? I, I don't remember hearing anyone say anyone's to blame for this ha hack. Was there any? Well, there. The, the, it's, it's Tim Crawford's problem. The, in a fail. <laughs> <laughs> from right under the bus as soon as he walks in. You didn't realize yeah. there was a bus coming for you. So you the, know, I, there I, are, I, it, it's going to be I, hard for the blame game because with uh, all these companies and all these teams doing agile and lean and uh, and quick turnaround and CICD and whatnot. There are a number of techniques that were used long ago and far away that have fallen by the wayside. I mean, back in the day, there used to be QA and QA would <laughs> start at the design level, the design spec level where there was a team specifically there to question designs, testability, uh, usability, security, et cetera. Now security has always kind of been like a uh, second citizen, but QA was always the champion of these downstream teams. QA doesn't exist anymore. Not it true. hasn't for years. And they're all Not talking true. shifting left. Well, that's because they shifted way out of the way again. So will there be, will they find someone to blame? Only if they can find an individual who is no longer at the company who specifically injected these particular bits. And if they find that they were injected over a course of time where it was a little bit here, a little bit there, they're not gonna be, they're not gonna find blame. They're just gonna say, oh, we need to improve our process. So then that Gina's big not here because Gina has experience actually was was there and was part of the product the product marketing for this the, that cool. product. But, it, but, it but, but this sense. is a big problem with agile in that it goes so fast that there's no time to have a systems level perspective. I, I, don't, I don't know, Rocky. I mean, I, I get your point, but um, in the teams that I've helped with agile or, uh, you know, I don't want to call myself anything approaching a DevOps expert. So that would, you know, that would be, um, I think. Ooh, uh, ooh, can I comment here? I tell everyone <laughs> you're an expert in everything. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Uh, no wonder I get all that spam. Um, but, um, you know, when I, when uh, the first time I put together a team that was similar to, in theory, to DevOps uh, was at Gilead in 2004, 2005 timeframe. And we got rid of the change management team and all that stuff. But the point of the DevOps process is not to remove, uh, oh, those, those ugly hindrances of people worried about what gets put into a firewall or people worried about um, whether the release to production will cause a disruption or a security hole. It, rather, it's actually to automate those things that are known, understood processes and um, actually allow you to deliver code and solutions more quickly and more accurately, right? I mean, the, you can yes. do it wrong. You can, you can definitely do it wrong. But the point of automation, we, we make jokes. Yeah, you could automate something that's bad, and it just makes it bad more often. But the point of automation, and DevOps certainly has a major component of automation associated with it, is to actually be repeating good behavior without having to talk to people every time that you do it. And um, I would say that in if I were to look back at some of the QA teams that I not necessarily been responsible for, but have worked with, like as recently as Epsera, I would say that maybe there is a difference between QA for success of code from a customer perspective 
and then QA from a quality of code, as in is the code efficient, et cetera, et cetera, but not necessarily QA from a content. Like if people read it and it makes sense and it doesn't seem to break anything, uh, um, are they even testing against it? Do they need to test against it? Um, how do they value or evaluate um, some string of code that they're not even worried about looking at because as far as they're concerned, it doesn't put any functionality at risk. Um, and I think that's a hard, um, a, a hard nut to crack. It oh, goes back to, really goes back to what Rob was to saying. Crack yeah. And Earlier. Agile makes it harder. Um, that's why you go back to uh, the space, space stuff and uh, the original IoT where you're not touching anything for how long has Voyager been sitting out there and, mm -hmm. and uh, transmitting data that's actually useful? Uh, that, that software, you make one small mistake in an upgrade and you've lost the system. Uh, so there's a lot different approach for those sorts of systems and back in the day when it made a bigger difference than today because everything is throwaway code. And DevOps definitely automating the systems makes it easier to validate and replicate and find the problems because then you're spending time on the hard stuff that you need human minds on rather than computing cycles. Mm -hmm. But without going back and accepting that uh, whatever you want to call it, it won't be called QA this next time round, but the analysis process that was used in the past to figure out whether code is architected reasonably well and whether it accounts for the stakeholders needs and uh, and even wants sometimes, although once is that thing that Mark was talking about, you don't want to have to put all the wants in there, but the needs until there is an analysis process that's systemic, uh, there, there's going to be a lot more of these holes found over time because we've gotten around away from applying system level thinking at the software developer process. And DevOps is in some ways a patch and the productization process that was required to add the quality doesn't exist in most of the code that doesn't exit a company. So if so, you all so I have a created like a product, you have a better time of it, except it I, have a I have a question. I have a question. Are we talking, are we talking about from the vendor perspective, or are we talking about how the customer develops code? Because I see those as two different things. So are we talking about solar winds as a company and how companies like solar winds develop code, or are we talking about the customers that were impacted and how they develop code or how they consume um, products and code? Uh, the solar winds, the, the company that's producing the production sold code, but okay. also uh, the part of the issue along those lines also is that if you have a product like solar winds, you do have customers that if you're not careful in how you produce solar winds and take into account the foibles of your customers, they can actually inject their own exploits that make solar winds uh, susceptible. So yes, but I'm trying to distinguish exactly. between the two because yeah. I see them as two completely separate issues. Yep. So product, the product, and okay. you know, part of the issue is the, the same care that was taken in creating the product uh, and, and validating that was uh, supposedly secure and usable and everything isn't taken with internal code such as the build server. Uh, the code that was put on that right. doesn't go through the same rigorous check process, ri ri rigorous but, test analysis process. But from a SolarWinds perspective, the supply chain aspect was, you know, that individual change would has a much smaller blast radius. It's much less likely to have an injection by somebody who's trying to trying to take advantage of 
I mean, I, that we're down in the, the details. I'm, I'm yeah, the details yeah. at this point. But I, but I think what, what we're both it makes it more around is, is complex. Is the is and um, and this to me is an inflection point that I'm, I'm tracking on the list. Right, we have a whole bunch of scale related inflection points and complexity of IT systems is part of that inflection point. Right? Are we are we talking around a a, a problem? And I don't think AI makes things less complex. Just it as, doesn't as make it le less complex, but, but for instance, if you apply uh, big data analysis to, uh, and if you have everything observable, so you turn on every single, yeah, but then every there's, there's too much. Marker. But the, this, this to me is here. So here's 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 where things are going, which is a challenge. I think. And we've talked about this in, in multiple sessions. There's a complexity explosion. We are we yep. are seeing an increase in complexity. You just look at the Kubernetes landscape, and that product is designed to increase complexity in IT organizations. <laughs> Rob, there right. actually always has been. It's this is not this is not new. I mean, Mark and I have talked about this in the past. I mean, yeah. complexity in IT is a reality and as soon as, the sooner you can admit it and accept it, the sooner you can start addressing it. But we're not going to get simpler as we go through time. So, so from that perspective, let me then see if I can run the, run the inflection point to ground. Is, is there a breaking point with complexity where we, we need to simplify things and they just got, they get, they get too complex and we, we start changing or is, you know, so is it? Are we the are we with the frog in the complexity hot water, or is you know actually we're, are we, we're or is this past. just just it's acceptable status quo and we're going to build it into our systems and it's going to get better? <laughs> no, the frog. You know, the frog in the boiling water. I think is is a great analogy for this. Um, we're past that point. People just don't. They either don't realize it or they're not looking at it from that perspective. But it's definitely. The water temperature has been increasing and the frog never realized it. And so we're past that inflection point. But I, I don't think the get the frog now in the boiling that... water. I mean. Uh, the, uh, the analogy is that, uh, that you can you can cook a frog by gradually turning up the water. They don't, they acclimate. They don't notice that the water is getting too hot. So they, uh, okay. too they would jump out. They, they, just... would, if, they would jump out if they felt like it was hot. But if they, if you slowly increase the temperature, they get used to so it. So you don't think CIOs didn't know? They, everyone knew this was happening, right? We keep designing systems. Or I mean, this is like SolarWind sells a product to mitigate operational complexity by having this behemoth of a monitoring infrastructure. It's like, oh, we're just adding a new widget in, right? I mean, this is Solar SolarWinds literally came in and said, you've got this incredibly complex divergent environment. We're going to sell you a tool that, that helps you monitor all things. Um, and that let them sneak in something under the radar that you didn't even didn't even realize was there. Charge and horse. I, but I guess that's the that's the point I'm trying to make is that this is not unique to solar winds. It's yeah. just solar winds solar winds is the one that that we're aware of at this point. But there are I'm certain there are more out there. I mean, this goes back to my my whole thing of IT running with scissors. So, you know, I asked the question, are we talking about the vendor or are we talking about the, the consumer of the products, right? We take this this product or project approach where we say, okay, we're going to put solar winds in and then we're off to the next thing. And we don't necessarily come back to it or manage it in a programmatic, programmatic way, right, as a product. And so... This is one of the core fundamental issues is, I mean, there are several, it's not any one, but several of these kind of came together. And I think that's why you're seeing this kind of hit the fan, if you will. Yeah, I think the customers run with grenades without pins. I, I okay, um, same, same analogy. Yeah, but are, does that, whereas, is, is that, is, is there an inflection point where we slow down this they, like people say, whoa, wait a second, I, I don't want to implement the new new and I'm I'm gonna that that's a CentOS the CentOS thing. There are lots of companies that don't implement the new new 
and they're considered old and stodgy or just slow and and you know, second tier or third tier or whatnot. But um, there are a lot of conservative uh, communities uh, and verticals and whatnot. So uh, I, I think oil and gas seeing, is conservative. I think we're seeing a lot of even those conservative companies start to move towards bleeding edge technologies and then get upset when they bleed. Yeah. Uh, especially the, the ones who have been so conservative and have all these processes change change control and all these other things and they move to the new stuff and suddenly things like you said bleed and then they're starting to then then they sit there and go whoa why is everything breaking except that they forget that they've changed their processes the whole yeah, there's not a culture thing. there yeah digitalization brings out a lot of the weaknesses of uh, company process yeah, I, I, I still, and it's probably a, a failed um, idea before it gets started, but, um, uh, you know, I, I've used the analogy before. We, we started talking about it at the beginning of the, of the discussion today a little bit, but, um, you know, you, if, if you find yourself um, needing to bucket water out of the bottom of the dinghy faster and faster, the answer is not to get more buckets. The answer is to fix the leaks. Mm -hmm. Right. And in in this particular case, um, I think it brings to bear and and are the combination of discussion around complexity and speed that we've included in the topic from the beginning um, leads me to believe that long term, the the only real successful answer is to have something that mitigates the risk by uh, monitoring the entire system, almost regardless of how it's put together. Yep. So you, you can take whatever building blocks you want to build the environment you need, but the system of governance that monitors that environment is what, is what tells you whether or not there are leaks or breaches or risks to availability, et cetera, et cetera. I just, and I, I realize that's a, it's a pipe dream today, but um, this problem is not gonna get easier. It's only gonna get harder. And but AI, how does that come together? Is that like at, the, at what level? Is it like at the hardware level, at the application level? Like, how do you even build that? Yeah, I mean, I don't. I'm not an AI specialist, right? So I'm just I'm just looking at it from the perspective of when I've done um, process of elimination type tools for things like intrusion detection and and things like that, um, or worked with partners who have helped me. And when, when I say I've done them, I haven't done shit. I, I couldn't code myself out of a paper bag. <laughs> Um, so, um, but when I've done those things, it's about understanding what the environment is supposed to look like in very, very simple terms and recognizing when there are anomalies and there are already AI ops oriented systems that allow you to take a look at an environment and understand where failure may occur and allow you to do remediation in many cases without ever having to touch any code or, um, send someone into a data center. And so those, those same practices have been used in small increments or in portions of infrastructure and applications, um, there are already companies now that automate the process of, of identifying anomalous behavior in network traffic patterns, peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking risks, and things like that to identify what actually might be considered anomalous or a security threat and allow you to address it. I, I just see that if we continue to focus on treating the symptoms, that the people that are breaking in We'll, we'll be breaking in with AI systems before we have AI systems to help protect against those break-ins by other AI systems. So I say, fucking jump the shark, you know, screw this, this short-term, let's screw the bolts in faster and faster and faster and go right to what it is we really need to protect the environment in a future that is likely to be threat actors using AI to, to pummel networks and firewalls and, and every other system uh, in your environment. Mainframes 2030, get on my platform, folks. I, well, this, <laughs> I, actually, what, 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 you're, what you're talking about is, is where I'm going with some of my notes about this from an inflection point perspective. Because at some point, what we're really saying is just pull the, you know, we're gonna have to pull the plug and keep people off infrastructures. 
Well, you hit the big red button on the Wait, manufacturing line, and then you sit there and figure out where the problems are, and you fix the manufacturing line. But we haven't hit that big red button yet. <laughs> what do you yeah. mean by well, off infrastructure? Well, what I'm what I'm saying is is that if if there is no way to you know if Mark's right and you're just like our AIs are getting more and more secure and we can't determine that our supply chain is safe. We're just going to cut, we're just going to dig a electronic moat around our buildings and not let traffic in or out and say, you know what, we don't have remote work. Um, come into the it's office. It's like that complete opposite of what's to... happening in the world. Well, this, well, is, why this, it's is... An, this is why it's an inflection point question. To yeah, me. I, do we get to you a know, point where it's undefendable and you have to result, take a dramatic action? Sorry, Tim. You know, I... I hate to say this. I'm I'm all for, you know, supporting Mark in any way I can, um, and I hate to say it, but he's right. He's absolutely right. But here's the problem: the train's already left the station, and so it's not as simple as just pulling the plug on it and and not doing it. It I I can't see how that realistically would play out because when you start to think about the entire value chain from infrastructure and the most basic technology all the way to the consumer, right? Uh, meaning each of us going into a grocery store or going to a gas station or going to a doctor's office, there's absolutely no way that we can go backwards. There's no way we can go backwards at this point. I mean, companies, companies even struggle today with outages of how do they kind of go back to a manual process or be able to, to address this. I, I agree with Mark, but there's gotta be, there's gotta be some solution in the middle that we can address it. But the piece that I know some of the communities that, that I'm party to and, and participate in, one of the things we have been talking about for some time, some time being a few years now is that the threat actors absolutely are using AI and some of the vendors that produce these types of products like Microsoft and Amazon are actually trying to identify when someone is using it for nefarious reasons as opposed to, or malicious reasons as opposed to um, productive pieces. And unfortunately that's incredibly hard to do, but no regulation. No, no, no. But, but Tim, I agree with you that that's a remediation. That's all remediation, and all we've been talking about here is remediation. The question is, you can't pull the plug. How do you get to the, the root? And I think it goes back to something I've said before, either on this or on the Tuesday call, is we have to get back to valuing good, solid engineering and engineering principles, and we, as engineers, technologists, have to do a better job of telling the business look, you're about to go off a cliff. If you make the decision, you will go off the cliff. Here is the data that demonstrates that. Do you want to be the next CEO like Target who got fired because they ignored good engineering principles, period? We as engineers have, look, the train has left the station and I think it's a good thing the train has left the station. It's not that we've gotten advanced that's the problem, is that we've got we've thrown out all the things that we learn along the way. We've we we we've done we, we you know, you can go to school and I don't I'm not beating up on schools or anything like that guys know where I'm coming from, but we 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 warded go get a certificate in coding and you're now a developer. Go get, you know, go take a course in Python, you now can code. And you now have the you know the, the engine, uh, a coder's um, um, thing, and then you got Google and all the rest of them selling a quick way. I mean, whole, AWS made its whole business on you don't have to worry about this infrastructure stuff. You don't have to worry about good principles. Just push the code. We'll take care of it. We have got to get back to solid engineering principles. That's good that's, skills. That's the that's the message. Running. That's the message to from reInvent was hey we're we're going to invent some AIs that take care of this for you. Just keep inventing, and we're gonna we're gonna improve the the operational stuff in the back end, right? This is like to, I, I I mean Keith, this is what scares me for this. It's it, we're making it easier and easier for people to leverage incredibly powerful tool. Yep. So uh, without so under without understanding, you know, sort of the the consequences for how to do that for how to do it. Um, 
right back in the back in the 80s right we used to have books about people doing a bio lab in their basement and unleashing a killer virus okay, hard to imagine i know but um <laughs> But that was right. We're we're getting to that point with AI and, and technology tools where, um, and you know, biohacking too, <laughs> and biohacking. Well, so, I, I like um, I like the sentiment um, uh, uh, Keith, from Keith, um, and I think that that should be a target and goal for uh, every organization. But uh, unfortunately, the reality of humans um, makes the that effort largely failed in long term for any organization. And I'll give you a simple example. As part of my job, I've also had to worry about physical security for data centers, et cetera. And when you've got somebody watching a monitor as an example for outside traffic, you never leave them on the monitor for more than an hour. It doesn't matter how much you beat that person. They cannot watch the monitor for more than an hour and be 100% effective at identifying threats or risks that are entering the property. Uh, and that's uh, when you're when you're the soldier guarding a, a camp, you never are allowed to walk the, the border more than a certain amount of time or, or because the assumption will be that your patience and, and attention will wander. And security, unfortunately, is the same thing. You you run security for two years and you don't have a threat. People begin to be people. And, um, and that's just the, the nature of humanity. And we can fight it like saying, um, well, just don't have sex because we don't want to give you condoms. So just don't have sex. And we all know how well that works. Yeah. Um, so we have, to, we, have to, we have to account for how humans live with the stuff if we're going to um, figure out how to address the problem. So when it gets to the yeah. point of at some point your firefighters become arsonists. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's I, an SD WAN. I, oh. I agree with Mark. This is those sorts of things, the monitoring and stuff, are perfect places where AI is currently capable of addressing a lot of the pitfalls. But we're in the second phase of expert systems at this point. Uh, back when expert systems was the first way of uh, freeing up the expensive people through AI, it was the experts would, would provide their knowledge to a, an AI uh, developer and would come up with a set of rules that they use to avoid these problems and whatnot. Now we're in training, but again, there, the limitation is if you don't know what to train the system on and all the different inflection points there it's going to have as many holes as a junior engineer or a junior whoever that's doing it so we still have the problem that ai can address some of the more ordinary uh repetitive repetitive issues but can't actually do the knowledge worker uh, heavy lifting. So there's a there's an SD WAN going back to what I think was Mark was just talking about. There's a, there's an SD WAN uh, company out of Port out of Beaverton that I've that I've worked with in the past. They just announced um, some risk monitoring uh, software uh, using using light AI, I guess is how I would put it. But the stats that they that they found on the number of alerts, one of the things that we don't that one of the things that we don't talk about a lot is the fatigue. Right, it's alert fatigue that that gets in there. I think it was, um, you know, they, basically not uncommon for IT and ops managers to see hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of alert emails each day. Uh, yeah, you know, ten thousand. I mean, at what point does ten thousand? A human can't process that. Yeah, no, they can't even really process hundreds, let alone thousands. I mean, that's right. what that's what I was talking about earlier on about right. using tools to help. Um, eliminate you know false positives and things like that and look for true anomalous behavior rather yeah. than exactly what's really right. action right what's really actionable right what's really yeah i i can't tell you how many conversations i've had with my teams around this just this one issue which is great now we put in this monitoring product now we're getting just pummeled with 
uh, alerts. And so what they do is they turn up the squelch on it so that they, they get fewer alerts, but they miss the, the core pieces the until after something has fall, fallen apart. And so the challenge there is how do you, how do you set it up just right? And I mean, granted, this is not a new problem. This is an old problem. I mean, I've ha been having these conversations with my teams for, t shoot, 20 years. Um, and so it's more than that, actually. But I think that the point here is we need better intelligence to understand what is real and what is not. And the technology is there. I don't think we're necessarily applying it as well as our mindset in the right way. This isn't just a technology problem. And that's the other piece here is that this yeah. th there isn't this silver bullet that we just drop in and, and automatically everything gets addressed. There has to be human intuition that comes into play in this. And I think that's the piece that we're ultimately missing, whether it's from the vendor perspective or the the consumer, you know, the buyer's perspective. Tim, I agree. And the basically there still needs to be people to manage the software and to handle the incoming alerts and the dashboards. And if you cannot can't do it internally, you need to, for example, a managed security service provider to actually be monitoring these things, to be able to take actions when necessary. Otherwise, you just paid yeah. money for software that you're not gonna use. And one of the, one of the yep. things I heard from Big from the C founder of Big Leaf when I was talking to him about that, about how he built it, he goes, it's the, tech, the AI is not enough. You've got to have people that have been in that industry long enough to be able to understand what is truly actionable and what is just noise because the AI is not going to be able to process that. You actually nope. have to have people that have been in that seat. That's this we, is we why have, I had wait, wait, ISS. But, <laughs> hold on. I need, I need one minute for hold logistics because I – right. I actually think we could do four hours on this and everybody would be animated and excited and it, that'd be easy. Um, actually, I've, I've been taking this conversation, the inflection points, and then breaking it back to questions. But here, here's my suggestion. Before we go into the seventh, are people interested in shifting this meeting to Tuesday morning or Wednesday morning for the next two sessions and lining out the, the questions a little bit? Basically, it's going to be me. I have to plan logistics for this, the the framework but i also have to start publicizing it so i'll be tapping on all of you to help um encourage people to come to the, the session but um i you know if you're not playing work that's fine i you know i'll i'll pull this together take my notes and and do the do Are the you topics do it during the devops time I could do no. Well, the next DevOps time is a book club, and then I wasn't going to do one next week. I was thinking of doing the same 8 a.m. slot, 8 a.m. Pacific slot, um, on the 22nd or the 23rd, and then do the same thing the 29th or the 30th, whichever we pick. Um, as long next, as you don't next. do Monday, Sundays I'm always up late for some strange reason. Yeah. Even when no, I'm it, not that's... working, body knows Sunday. Stay up till three. <laughs> I get it. No, Tuesday, it would be, it would be, a, my, my thought would be to do it on a Tuesday. Um, stay, stay farther away from the holidays, but I'm, I'm game. Okay. Oh, wait, Tim said he's game. So I'm not game. I'm out. <laughs> All right. I, uh, I will, I will, I'm, I will do I'm the modifications out. for those two events on to, on to Tuesday. Um, this is a, like, my head is exploding. These are, we're, we're getting to this interconnected because it's this long thread. We're getting to these interconnected components of these discussions. Um, and I think if we a little bit more and then the Thursday converse, the, the seventh is going to be an amazing conversation and more, even more will come out of it. But I, I I'm going to ask for help getting it publicized because the more, if we get about 20 people, I think it'll be a critical mass. So yeah. I just wanted to say that Mark's yeah. right about the AI. It's really got to pick up uh, the pace, uh, but AI is deep. And so the real key is figuring out where we apply the human knowledge and, and actively and cognitively say, this is handleable by the AI with a training system. And this is where you have to turn real human eyes on it and define 
the level so that you can actually put in intelligent alerting systems because you need to turn down the alert levels and you have to use AI for it, but you have to be able to say, this isn't, this isn't handleable by AI at the moment. We don't have a system that's either deep enough or enough knowledge or expertise to be able to apply it in a training situation or whatnot. So yeah, and the real key is figuring out, somebody's gonna make lots of money figuring out how much is enough AI and uh, yet not too much. Anybody yeah. want to start a company? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, uh, we, you know, we all, we all can assume that, that what AI will eventually accomplish, but it's not, it, it's an easy, an easy stretch of the imagination to say that, um, uh, you know, we, you could, in theory, uh, see the images uh, as, you know, two dragons fighting each other, and it's one AI attempting to break in and another AI trying to figure out how to keep it out, right? And, and who, gets, who gets the keep out AI in first may be what saves the planet from the break in AI and vice versa. You're, I also well, see it though as the, the two dragons over, over Tokyo. The, dragons. the human Sorry. dragon masters overseeing and, and tweaking them here and there. Yeah, but but this is this is like the this is like Godzilla in Tokyo. Because yeah. the way that, Godzilla that you're gonna versus Mothra. Right. No, but it's you know, there's 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 people behind trying to steer it, but what's gonna happen is they're gonna wreak just re, you know, even the good robot, even the good AI is gonna wreak havoc as it shuts down systems trying to protect, like it's gonna, oh, I need this building out of the way. Sorry, all those users, you gotta, you know, I'm knocking you over until until I've dealt with the threat. Right, I mean, we've, we've seen, this is a, an incredibly complex discussion topic, right? I mean, we could literally spend a weekend uh, around, a, you know, peyote fire um, uh, and not cover all of it. But if you, if you think I mean, about, <laughs> I'm willing to try. Let's not even bother. Let's just start with the peyote yeah. fire. We'll be... um, but if you, if you think about uh, how complex our systems are already, and and, um, and then you think about how difficult so many organizations find it in keeping bias out of AI. Imagine someone who thinks they can instantaneously make determinations about uh, making a change to the way AI is doing something without better understanding what the add-on side effects of that change might be as they ripple through the entire environment. Love how you did that without even saying the word Zuckerberg. Yeah, well. <laughs> you guys later, bye. <laughs> Everybody, I, I, I'll officially move it in cloud 2030, but I already moved the invites and we'll keep going. This is amazing. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, guys. Wow, it's amazing to go back even a couple of months and realize how many of these core topics, automation, AI, uh, controls, play out over and over again um, in, in a routine basis for us. So if these discussions are, are important to you and you have an opinion, please join us.